we started the conversation last week called Days. And what we've kind of come to the conclusion is that days, uh, faith rather, faith only works if it's uh, every day. A faith is only applicable and only works for us if we can have it every single day. And it's not enough to have faith one day and not the next. Like God has created the earth to have a rhythm to it. We see seasons and we see death and life and we see things moving and changing. And what I've realized is that that isn't just a big global season, but actually God has created a rhythm for us in our lives and it continues throughout our days. And so it's so important that we understand the power that can take place in a given day. For thousands of years throughout history, there's been meaning and intention behind every single day, and yet we just live it like it's just a Monday, like it's just a Wednesday. And we don't realize the deep practical and spiritual implications that every single day holds in our lives. And so there's this natural rhythm that we are taking part in. And so last week we started talking about Sunday, uh, Solus Deus, uh, Day of the Lord. And we talked about the reality that God has created, intentionally set aside time for us to rest. And we find that rest in our, in our week and we stop and we take a pause and we try to lean into what God is trying to teach us in silence and in rest. And if you missed last week, you can find it online. But today we're going to move into Monday. Anybody like Mondays? Daniel likes Mondays. He admitted it first service, and he would not admit it second. I was waiting. Nobody likes Mondays. Nobody likes Mondays, and yet here we are with them. You know, you get like 52, and we just have to kind of reconcile with them. Uh, Monday is just kind of that day that everybody loves to, to hate, and the reality is um, Mondays are difficult because we have a long break. So you get like Saturday and Sunday to take a break, a breather. And it's like, do I really want to start again on Monday? Like, is that really something I want to do? Uh, and yet we realize in, in many other cultures, Monday is actually translated into day after holiday. Uh, and the reason is because we come af off of a break. The funny thing this weekend is that uh, Monday is a holiday. So we are celebrating since 1897, I think it is, or 94, we have been celebrating the labor force of American work people by taking a break. How ironic is it that we celebrate tomorrow by taking a break? We're like, hey, congrats for everybody who worked hard. We're going to take a break. And so we have this idea that we get to Monday and it's like, oh, here we go. But I want to mess with every single Monday for the rest of your life. Do I have your permission to mess with every single Monday from now to the remainder of your life? I want every single Sunday night when the clock rolls over to Monday for you to see Monday differently. I don't ever want you to wake up and see Monday the same way. So do I have your permission? See, Monday, Monday has is, is largely been called Moon Day for most of history. Moon Day. And we've dropped the O over time, but the reason they called it Moon Day is because we told times and seasons by the phases of the moon. And so we largely call it Moon Day. So the next time someone says it's Monday, don't correct them because you don't want to be that guy. But just know in your head you're smarter than that person. It's Moon Day. And, and we don't look at the, the moon anymore to see what season it is. But we can look outside. We can tell what season it is. We know fall's coming. We feel that just slight tease of fall, and so we know it's coming. We know by our, our watches and our calendars what day it is, and so we've created new and creative ways for us to keep up with time, and so we've dropped the O, and it's moon day now, and, and we have so many of these moon days or Mondays, we've got to figure out what to do with them, and what I've realized is that practically Sunday's the first day of the week, right? We talked about that last week. However, in the economies, it's Monday, when Monday rolls around, the NASDAQ opens, people start trading, you win money, you lose money, you, uh, people go to work, and the economy kicks off. And then, so Monday is, 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 for all intents and purposes, the first day of the week. Uh, however, we realize uh, Sunday really is, and Monday is the day, though, for us to jump back in and to harness the day. To not regret it, to not look down upon it, to not, uh, you know, look, oh, here it comes, here we go again. But for us to actually harness the power that is Monday. And here's what I believe about Monday or Moon Day. I believe Monday is the day of new beginnings. I believe Monday is the day for a new start. I think we have this whole week where we may trudge through it. You might have had a, a bad Friday and like a, a weird Saturday and a terrible Sunday. But Monday is coming. And it doesn't matter what your week has looked like. What I love about Monday is if we'll begin to look at it as the day of new beginnings, we can go, I'm going to start over. 
I'm going to start over. Whatever has happened this week, I get to start over. And I get 52 opportunities to start over every year. And I get to start over and start over and start over and start over because God doesn't want us to stay stuck. And what happens a lot of times is we end up getting stuck, but the reality is God gave us Mondays to help us start over. And I want Mondays for the rest of the week to be new beginnings. I don't know about you, but I need a new beginning. Do you need a new beginning? Like I just have weeks where I'm like, all right, do over. Let's just start it over. Like, where's the delete? Where's the reset? How do, we, how do we start over? And I need Monday to come. And so when it's here, we have this spiritual and practical obligation to go, okay, we're going to make sure we start over. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is a really powerful passage that we, if you've been in church for a while, have largely probably passed over. Or maybe you've heard it and you think I've heard it before and so uh, we kind of commit it to you know, memory and we go, ah, it's already something that I've heard. So we don't really understand that this is a deep spiritual promise that first and foremost it says anyone, if anyone is in Christ Jesus. That says anyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter where you come from. doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter, your, uh, matter if your education level is high or low. doesn't matter race, creed. doesn't matter what language you speak. Anyone can find a new beginning, can become a new creation. Anyone, if it's found in Christ. There's a promise that comes with this challenge. This promise is for those who are found in Christ, not for people who are found in themselves. Not for people who are, uh, find their identity in, uh, in, 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 their, in something else other than Christ. Maybe it's a, a, a denomination, or maybe it's a, a political party, or maybe it's their own efforts, whatever it is. This promise is for those who find themselves and their identity in Christ, that the newness starts in our lives when we align our lives with God, it starts with the decision to follow Christ first and foremost. So what I want you to know this morning is that we've been made new. You, me, us, we've been made new, but we don't really understand the practical reality. We don't understand the, the gravity or the weight of what being made new actually means to us because for, by and large, we've become accustomed to how we live. In fact, the vast majority of us would probably say, I don't need to be made new. I haven't messed up that bad this week. I've been pretty good, and so why do I need to be made new? And, and for so many of us, myself at the top of the list, I, I can't truly understand what it means to be made new until I understand why I need to be made new. That the reality for all of us is that we're sinners. John 3.16 tells us we're all sinners, but also, like, we can look at one another and be like, yeah, you're a sinner, and I'm a sinner, and, and you're a sinner, Daniel's a sinner. Like, everybody's a sinner. We're all sinners. And the reality is that we don't really understand or see ourselves as sinners, or we think, I don't sin quite as bad. Like, I sin, but it's, I'm not as bad as Daniel, <laughs> because he likes Mondays. So we say these things like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously we're sinners, John 3.16, uh, but, uh, but, but. I'm not that bad. And the reality for all of us is that we have uh, allowed sin to permeate our hearts, permeate our minds, and seep into our lives uh, so subtly that, that sin enters our lives in such a subtle way that if we give in to sin long enough, we start to commit it to muscle memory, meaning that all of a sudden uh, sin becomes like driving home or, or, or writing a letter or brushing your teeth. It just becomes maybe commonplace. And when it becomes a habit in our lives, we don't always realize that we're partaking in it. I brushed my teeth this morning, but it is not something I've thought about until just now. I drove here, but I didn't pay attention. Like, I just got here because it was habit for me. And what we've done is we've allowed sin to become habits that we all of a sudden just partake in, and we don't really understand what it's doing to our souls. We don't understand how it's dramatically affecting our lives and the people around us. And that sin has become so commonplace. And Satan, he has a very clear path that he walks us through. We can find how he starts uh, doing his work in Genesis with the very first human beings, and Adam and Eve. 
And we can see how he works his way into their life and, and creates a, a pattern or a habit of sin. But what's really fascinating is that Satan isn't a create, creative being. And so he uses the same tactics he did in Genesis as he does thousands of years later today. And it starts with doubt in the twisting of the truth and then shame for missing out and fear for not being enough. And then what happens for all of us is we start to buy this lie that we need something other than God. In fact, in my opinion, all sin is giving in to the lie that you need something other than God. Think about that for just a moment. All sin is buying into the lie that you need something other than God, whether it's gossip or lust or greed or, or whatever you can list. It's all assuming that we need something other than God. And when we fall into this cycle of sin, we don't always realize that we're in it. We don't always realize that we're in this pattern. We don't realize that we're being subtly lied to about who we are. But Monday's here. Monday's the day where we push the pause button, where we, we stop for just a moment, and we remind ourselves that we're never stuck. See, what happens with sin is it's like a truck driving down the interstate over and over. It just wears ruts into the road. And if you've ever driven, you feel your car kind of slide right into it. Sin's much the same way. And as hard as we try in our own effort to get out of that, we slide right back into those old behaviors. We slide right back into that old pattern. And what happens is if we keep sliding into that long enough, we give up. We say, well, I've tried to get out. I tried to be better. I've tried to do different things. And I, 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 and it can't, it doesn't work. And so this is just who I am now. And we stop being people who sin and we start being sinners. It stops becoming something we do and it starts becoming who we are. And we see this play out where we might gossip for a little bit and then people start seeing us as a gossip and we go, ah, I guess that's just who I am. I'm a gossip or a lust or whatever. And we see this play out in, in, in all sins. It stops becoming something that we partake in. It starts becoming who we are. And we forget that we're never stuck. Isn't it funny how often we forget that we have the power and the ability through Jesus Christ, God-given power and ability to break uh, the habit of sin in our lives, but instead of working through that, receiving the grace of Jesus and forgiveness in our lives, we just go, I guess I'm stuck here. This is just who I am now. And we need Mondays to go, I'm not stuck. Just because I've made a mistake doesn't mean I am a mistake. Just because I've done things that are wrong doesn't mean that I am wrong and I need to unstick, I need to allow God to unstick me. However, being a new creation doesn't mean that we're perfect. I think the, the, one of the greatest misnomers about walking into a room like this and entering into a relationship with Christ is that God expects perfection. There's no, if I can't be perfect, you can't either. There's no perfection. There's no perfection, I'm joking. There's no perfection. We're not, the goal is not perfection. The goal is to be changed consistently. The goal is to realize we've been changed and are being changed. And so the goal is not perfection. Jesus Christ didn't die to, to, uh, to change our behavior. He died for us to connect our lives with Christ and to get on a new mission and to be a new person. And so we have to be reminded daily, every Monday, Revelation 21, 5, says the one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. This just isn't like a turning over a new leaf or getting your life back together. This isn't something that God does for us. It's something that God does in us. And he doesn't just patch us up, but he actually makes us new. Uh, I've had a flat tire uh, many times, and I'll go to the tire store, and I'll be like, my tire's flat. And they're like, yeah, there's a nail in it. Do you want a patch, or do you want a new tire? And I go, well, what's the price difference? And they go, well, you know, patch is $10, and new tires, and I go, just the, the patch. Like, you don't even have to tell me, because if it's more than $10, I'm going with the patch. Like, well, you're going to have problems down the road. I'm like, then we'll deal with those down the road, right? Because that's how we deal with things. That's how I deal with things. I think we deal with sin the same way. You're okay, I've messed up. Let's just patch it, and we'll worry about the details later. We'll worry about why I sinned, and the habit of sin, and the pattern of sin, and the, the depths of depravity, and the grace of God. We'll worry about all that later. I just want the patch, and we want a patch because it's quick and easy. And a lot of us are the byproduct of just patching and patching and patching. And it's not that God doesn't desire to patch, but I believe we can only patch for so long. I think he wants to make us new. And there's a dramatic difference in being made new versus being patched. That the newness is, is something fresh, but we have to allow that newness to permeate our habits, our behaviors, our lifestyle, our speech. It all needs to reflect the newness of God. 
And the problem is, because of muscle memory, we end up sliding back into that habit, that, that pattern. We break out for a moment in our own efforts. We slide right back in, and we break out, and we slide right back in. If you've ever tried to go on a diet, and then you realize somebody shows up with, you know, donuts. Like, yeah, I guess I'll try just, just a dummy. I don't want to be rude. And then you eat the donut, and you're like, well, I guess I'll have two donuts, because you can't just have two. If it's Krispy Kreme, you have to eat four just to make up to feel like you've eaten one. And so the next thing you know, you're not on a diet anymore. And a lot of us live this pattern in our lives. Not the diet thing, but the sin thing. Like, I'm not going to sin anymore. Like, well, maybe just a little sin. <laughs> maybe just a little more, just a little more. Eventually, we just give up trying. But Mondays are the day that we're reminded we're not stuck. You don't have to keep living in that lifestyle. You don't have to keep living in that pattern. You don't have to keep going around the same issues because so often we see, okay, if I sin, I know this is the byproduct. If I do something wrong, I know this is the the end result. And I don't want the end result, but a lot of us don't want to change our behaviors or patterns. We just don't want the end result anymore. And we want God to fix it all. God, take care of it all. And he's saying, I will change you on the inside, but you have to allow the inside to come out. You have to allow what I've done in your heart to actually change your actions and your speech and your behaviors. And so often we're like, nah, that's, that's not, I don't want to do that. I just want the end result to be changed. And God keeps reminding us that Mondays are the day where you are constantly reminded every week that you're made new. That you're made new. And as you and God interact through prayer and scripture reading and worship, you begin to wear new ruts into your mind. You begin to create new muscle memory. More than breaking uh, this, this way of living, you actually begin to relearn how to live without that sin. A lot of us have been so immersed in sin for so long, we don't know how to live without it. We first don't recognize it, and when we recognize it, we go, but I need it because it's who I am. I need to be this way. I need to talk this way. I need to act this way. We don't recognize that you weren't created to talk and live and act like that. But we can't imagine a life without it, so we have to relearn. If you've ever had surgery or injured yourself and you needed to uh, be rehabilitated, you went to a physical therapist, and they pushed you and they worked you and they moved you in ways you don't want to move, and they challenged you and encouraged you, and they helped you learn a new way to function. See, I think spiritually we need to go through physical therapy. Because we have a culture that is constantly telling us this is the way that you should live. And we give in to that so many times. And we need a spiritually physical therapist, uh, a spiritual physical therapist to come in and go, no, you don't have to do that. We can break out of this habit. And practically, there are times when we need to relearn new things spiritually. I believe we need to relearn how to speak. We need to relearn how to conduct ourselves. We need to relearn how to behave, what's appropriate and what's not, what's moral and what's immoral. And we don't look to the world to teach us what's moral and immoral. We look to God's word to relearn, to rediscover how we can conduct ourselves. And some of us, we've tried to talk better, we've tried to act better, and, and we've tried to reflect our, our new life in Christ, but the old just slides back in. And so we have to realize we're not going to try in our own effort. Because in our own efforts, we can't be good enough. We can't be holy enough. We can't be spiritual enough. It's not that our efforts don't count, but we cannot rely on our own strength any longer. We have to rely on the strength of God. And Monday is a reminder that we begin again. It's a reminder that God isn't done working on us. It's a reminder that we're a work in progress. We're a piece of art that's not finished. A statue that's still being carved out. But have you ever had a moment in your life where you really felt like God was doing something, but you couldn't see it. I've known people who are like, man, God did this really incredible thing in my life, and I'm like, maybe, you know, prob- maybe, but it also, you know, could just be life, you know, maybe paying you a favor, like, could just be coincidence. Like, there are times where I wonder, and in my own life, I find it so difficult to see God in real time, but I can always see him in hindsight. I can always see what he did in the past, but I have a hard time seeing what he's doing right now, and I get frustrated. And, and one of the most practical examples for me in my life recently um, is when we uh, moved here, we purchased a home here in Evansville, but we hadn't sold our house in Chattanooga yet. And so uh, for a couple of weeks, I was on the phone with lenders going, hey, can I borrow money for two homes? And I had them go, well, you know you're a pastor and not uh, someone who's wealthy, so no, you know what I mean? And, and so I, for several weeks, I was being reminded that I cannot own two homes. Uh, I think I finally might have figured it out right at the end, but it was really suspect. And so my wife, who has more faith than I, um, was like, ah, it's fine. God's got it. I'm like, does he though? 
we should probably call a few more lenders, right? Just to make sure. And uh, we, we sold our house and we closed on our house the same day that we closed on the house that we sold. And so there was like this really weird coincidence where we, we exchanged homes on the exact same day. And it's a coincidence that can only be described as God working in our lives in the practical. And, and it's remarkable to see. But I couldn't see it in real time. I could only see it once it happened. And I'm like, oh yeah, that was, that was God. But I don't want to always be somebody who sees what God's doing in hindsight. But what I've found to be true in my life and in all the others is that sin so often creates blinders in our lives where we cannot see what God is doing in our lives. And it's only when we actually physically turn all the way around in hindsight and look and we go, oh yeah, God was at work at all times. But I believe God wants to remove the blinders from us by removing the sin and the habits of sin in our lives. And he wants to create us new so that we are people who actually see what God is doing in real time. But if you'll remember this character named Moses, he saw this burning bush. Moses is walking around, for those who aren't familiar with the story, and he sees a burning bush, and he's like, oh, it's a burning bush, and the burning bush starts talking to him. He's like, oh, it's a talking, burning bush, and it's God. And I'm always fascinated by this story. Even when I was a kid, I'm like, this is a wild story. Like, I don't know if I buy it, right? Like, that's insane. I've never seen this happen. But then I also think, wouldn't this be cool if this happened to me? Wouldn't it be cool if, like, you walked out and, like, one of our bushes was just on fire, and you're like, hey, let's talk to that one, you know? And in, in Exodus 3, it says, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Herob, the mountain of God. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. There's two really remarkable things happening, about to be a third. So Moses thought, I'll go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, he answered. <laughs> I just imagine Moses being scared. Maybe he was prepared for it. But I'm thinking if a bush is talking to me, I'm going to be terrified, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He says, here I am. But see, what's interesting about this passage is it doesn't tell us how long this bush had been burning. It just says that it's burning and Moses noticed and God was speaking to him when he noticed. It never describes how long this bush had been burning. What if this bush had been burning for weeks, months, years? What if Moses had passed it every day and been like, oh man, there's another brush fire. I mean, there's another. What if the whole field was on fire and he just wasn't paying attention? It never describes how long and how much he may have been ignoring it. In verse 4 it says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush. It was only when Moses went to look. It was only when Moses had the courage. It was only when Moses had the curiosity. It was only when Moses stopped and carved out time in his life, took the blinders off, and decided to pay attention to the bush, the flaming bush that God actually spoke. But is it possible that there were bushes all around him and he just didn't have the eyes to see it? Is it possible that God was trying to speak all around him? And everything that was going on in his life was just a flaming bush going, I'm over here, come pay attention to me. And Moses was just stuck with tunnel vision. And it was maybe God heating things up around him to get him to pay attention to what he's trying to say. And then I wonder how many times in my life am I walking past burning bushes? Asking God, hey God, can you speak? Can you show me you're real? But I'm more consumed with the life I'm living. I'm more consumed with the, the sin that I think I need to be a part of. Or I'm more consumed with, with other things that are other than God. And God's got all this stuff heating up and burning around me. And he's wondering, when are you going to take notice? When are you going to stop and pause in your workplace? There's a fire going. In your, in your coffee shop you visit, there's a fire going. In your, in your home or in your church, there are fires burning everywhere. And he's just waiting for us to stop and notice and pay attention to what he's trying to do in our lives. He wants to begin a conversation with you and I. But we're stuck passing all of these things going, where's God at? What's he doing? See, I want us to be people who notice the fire. I want us to be people who every Monday stop and go, God, am I missing something? God, have I been walking around life all week going, where are you? I want to see you at work. And, and I haven't noticed that you're at work all around me. I don't want to wait for things to start heating up in my life for me to stop and go, something's not right. 
There's some sin in my life and I probably need to take care of it. Or there's a problem in my home and we probably don't need to keep ignoring it. Like, I don't want to wait for things to heat up. But I want to notice what God's doing in, in real time. And I want us to be people who see God at work everywhere. And when we choose Jesus, it's an informed decision between uh, his burning bushes everywhere. When we choose Jesus, it's a decision to go, I want to see you in every aspect. But see, if you're on the fence about your faith, seeing a burning bush would really clear some things up for you, wouldn't it? If you're not sure about God, his existence, seeing a burning bush would really cause you to, you know, stop and relook at life. So I think when we find these things happening around us, it creates a catalyst in our life when we recognize it that creates change, it sparks change. And if you've been made new, all of a sudden, now you're made new in Christ and you live for others. See, when you see the fire, you then become the fire. There's this fascinating thing that happens that when you see the fire, you all of a sudden become the fire for others. You become the burning bush, that sign, that guidepost, that catalyst for other people in their life. It's not enough for us to see the fire and hear from God, but we all of a sudden become the change that others need. And so the other thing I want you to know is that we make things new. We aren't just made new, but you and I make things new. We've been created by the great creator to create. We are part of creation, and we continue to create. We get to make things new, and in 2 Corinthians 5.18, it continues. Everything is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We become that burning bush, that thing that enters into people's lives and say, hey, you don't have to live this way. You don't have to be stuck. I, I was stuck, and I got unstuck. God unstuck me. So now you can be unstuck too. We become that burning bush that, that helps others reconcile their relationship to God. We become that gift that people are waiting for. And if you've been made new, God invites you and expects you to step into the ministry of reconciliation to make relationships right again. And God wants a fire burning in us so bright that others take notice, and that's exactly what happens. If you've been living in a pattern of sin, maybe you've just li been living a, a dull life beneath your God-given potential, and all of a sudden you reconnect and reconcile with God, your flame begins to burn brighter and people take notice. But God didn't come here to get everyone to behave or, or, or vote a certain way or, or live a certain way. He came to make things new and for us to realign our lives with him and to keep making things new because we make mistakes and God uh, gives us grace and forgiveness, and that's the relationship we have with him. But guess how God reconciles the world to him? He does through, so by and large through us, that he uses us. He chooses to use us as heralds of reconciliation, of burning bushes everywhere, wherever you go today, whatever restaurant you patronize, you're the burning bush. Will you bring this uh, ministry of reconciliation with you? And he made everything by speaking it into existence, but he chose to use me and you to connect people to God. And so we become this metaphorical fire starter in other people's lives. But have you ever thought, how can I be a positive influence in other people's lives when they've seen the worst side of me? How can I be a light and a fire for God when they've seen me say all those things and do all those things? How am I able to all of a sudden be this herald of reconciliation and this ambassador for God's grace when, when they know that I've been such a sinner? And the reality for all of us is that when people see how messy our lives was and we stop hiding all of our junk and our scars, people all of a sudden see God's transforming and renewal power in real time. That guy was bad and now he's not. That girl was doing bad, and now she's not. We see if God can do it in them, he can do it in me. See, you and I are proof of God's existence in our world. We're proof that God is working. Because if he can do something in me, he can do something in you. And that's what Mondays are for. Mondays are to remind us that we've been made new, but there are a chance also to start something new. And so that's exactly what we want to do. I want you tomorrow morning when your feet hit the floor to go, I'm going to start anew. 
I know you're going to be in vacation mode, and you're going to want to probably lay in bed a little longer, but when your feet hit the floor to celebrate the day that everyone else has been working throughout history, I want you to say, I'm not stuck. I'm not stuck. I'm starting new. I'm starting fresh. Every Monday is a chance to begin again. And you may mess up all week, and it's not an excuse to mess up, but you may have had a bad week, but I want you to know Monday's the day you start over. Monday's the day that God brings fresh renewal into your life, and we have 52 chances to start over. And what we realize is that God put the moon in the, in the sky that pulls the ocean and that changes the light to darkness, and it's to remind us that there's a rhythm to life. And if he's able to do that, surely he's able to do something new in us. And he doesn't care what rhythm you've been living He wants to create something new in you. So however you've been living, you can start over. You can start fresh. You can start anew. And here's what's beautiful. You can start new every Monday. Every Monday you can go, God, I I need to start over. Because I've lived weeks where I'm like, nope, got to do it over. I've done things, I'm like, ah, I wish I could take that back. And Monday's that day. Now, there are some practical implications. Like if you really make mistakes, there's some legal stuff you gotta deal with or or practical things. You can't expect everyone to give you a fresh start every Monday, but God will. He'll start over. And we're not measured uh, by our success or failure. We're measured by our ability to get up and keep giving our lives over to God. So that's what I want us to do every single Monday. If you would bow your head and close your eyes. God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We've not done what we were supposed to do because largely we failed to be an obedient church. We've not done your will. We've not upheld your law. We've rebelled against your love. We've not loved our neighbor. We've not heard the cry of the needy. So forgive us in this moment. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ and help us all to start anew. Help us all to start fresh, start anew in our relationship with you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody say amen. If you would go ahead and stand across the room this morning.